This episode is part one of two. It discusses themes of mental health, abuse, and childhood trauma. Listener discretion is advised. This is The Fall Line. Robin Burton has been searching for a long time. She's looking for her mother, and along the way, she's worked on behalf of a lot of other missing people. But she's still waiting for the day that answers come for her, too. We've known about Robin Burton's work for years now. If you follow missing persons cases on social media, there's a good chance that you do, too. She's run the Facebook page, Missing and Homeless, since 2015. Through the page and her real-world, on-the-ground work, Robin shares posters, information, and messages from families seeking relatives whom they know to or believe to be unhoused. She shares videos or photos supplied by unhoused individuals, too, who are trying to reconnect with their loved ones. There are calls to action when someone notices a local unhoused individual has gone missing. Really, there are as many situations as there are people whose faces appear on her page. Robin has had help in the past, but these days, she runs the social media on her own. It's something she does between her own full-time work and her responsibilities at home, including helping out with her young granddaughter. She's devoted to finding missing persons among the unhoused community. That's because Robin knows how many of these cases slip through the cracks, how many cases are never reported at all. By the time an unhoused individual is recognized as missing, they may have lost contact with their families. The alarm might be raised by local outreach workers who don't have all the information needed for a formal report. Friends in the community might be extremely concerned, but hesitant to speak to law enforcement. So... Robin's page serves as a middle ground. They don't have to know where a person was last seen or with which agency they have to file. They can just share what they know and then the information circulates. People who are part of homeless communities follow the page too. Robin gets out in her own city and so do others. And the end result is that cases have been solved. Parents and children are reunited. Phone calls are made. Friends separated by cities or states are back in touch. Sometimes, there's what society views as a happy ending. Other times, things are more complicated. But Robin's been there through all of it, and she's still looking among the unhoused communities in Illinois, where she lives, and in California, and now across the United States. It began with her need to find her own mother years ago, For so many families we speak with, the search has been unending, the hope for any sign of life. But for Robin, she got that sign, and that's why things have been so complicated. Robin is the daughter of a woman named Claudia Leslie Wells. Claudia is spelled in a unique way, C-L-O-U-D-I-A, like cloud. But Claudia normally goes by her middle name, Leslie. That's if she's using her real name. Often, she doesn't. That's something to remember when we tell you this story. Leslie has lived many different lives. Robin knows about some of them. There are probably more that she hasn't yet uncovered. Robin gathers as much information as she can, though, because it might help her discover where Leslie is today. Robin was primarily raised by her grandparents in Illinois. Though she does think of Leslie as her mother, she also considers her grandparents, her parents, and thus her aunts and uncles as siblings. At some points, Robin and Leslie did live together. But when Robin was little, her grandparents were the people who created structure. During Robin's teen years, her life was less settled. Sometimes she moved state to state, from relative to relative, and Leslie dipped in and out of her life. That continued until the day Leslie disappeared altogether. Now Robin searches for missing people in unhoused communities across the United States because she hopes she'll find Leslie out there, in one of them. And that's not an empty wish. She has strong evidence that her mother could be living on the streets today. But to get you to that point in the story, 
to what Robin discovered, we need to start much, much farther back with both their lives, Leslie's childhood, and with Robin's. We sat down with Robin this past fall, and she told us the story of her family, not just Leslie, because it all ties together. Her grandparents, who were children of the Depression, they were natives of Southern Missouri. Robin remembers most that they'd had to work hard and early to survive. I know that they used to pick cotton until their fingers bled whenever they were younger, both of them. Whenever they got married, she was 14 and my grandfather was 21. And my grandfather, my great-grandfather told my dad that he wasn't allowed to marry my grandma until she turned 14. Back then, it was, that was normal. Eventually, Robin's grandfather got work at a steel mill in Illinois. They'd raised their six children there, including Leslie. Leslie was the fifth child. She had two older sisters, two older brothers, and a younger sister. My mom grew up in Collinsville, Illinois. It was a little poor town, actually. It's a Collinsville address, but everybody called it State Park. And uh, my grandparents were religious, and they were strict. The girls weren't supposed to date until they were 18. The boys could date when they were 16. My grandfather worked at um, Granite City Still. He couldn't read or write. The only thing he could do is sign his name. And he would sit in Granite City Still every single day until they finally hired him. And my grandmother stayed at home and raised the children. My mom, she had a pretty normal childhood. I mean, there was some crazy things that she'd done as a child. There was a story that I heard that um, they were leaving my great-grandparents' house, which would be her grandparents'. It's going to get confusing because I also call my grandparents, my mom and dad. But they were leaving her grandparents' house and they were coming back home. She told uh, her sister Janet. Her and Janet are two years apart and they grew up looking like twins almost until they got older. But when they were little, they looked a lot alike. And she said that she was going to jump out of the car and she was probably like six or seven years old, maybe younger. And her sister said, I dare you. And she did. She actually jumped out of the car while the car was moving. And my grandfather stopped. She said that her sister pushed her out. Of course, she didn't. Looking back, Robin says that it's hard to pin down the precise cause of her mother's impulsiveness. It could be related to the mental health issues Leslie would be diagnosed with as a teen. Or, Robin thinks, it might be tied to the serious trauma that Leslie reportedly experienced in her adolescence. This is something Robin was told about much, much later when she was an adult. Robin does not want to get into the specifics, but she can understand Leslie's behavior better in that light. There are gaps in Robin's knowledge of her mother's teenage years. She discovered that, at some point, Leslie underwent what Robin describes as shock treatment, a much older form of the treatment now known as ECT. It's unclear precisely when this occurred, and she can't ask her grandparents, as they've both passed away. But one of Robin's aunts was able to recall the experience, and she told her about it. In the next interview section, you'll hear Robin refer to Janet as both her sister and her aunt. That's simply based on how she grew up. She also refers to her grandmother and grandfather, both as grandparents and parents. And she said that my grandfather made my sister Janet sit up there with my mom. And she said that it was the most scariest thing that she'd ever witnessed, that she would look at my mom and say, okay, and she said that my mom would just stare off in space like she wasn't there. It was just a shell of a body. She said that she'd never been so scared in her whole entire life. And she said that she doesn't know why my mom was given shock treatment because she said that she was a normal little girl like the rest of them. She doesn't know what happened, why she was given that. Does Janet remember how old they were? When that happened? I don't know. She, uh, she had to have been at least 15 or 16 years old. Janet said that she doesn't know why that she got shock treatment. So the only thing she can think of is like, my mom got caught one time. She snuck out and her and another one of her little friends was running with some boys that night. And, you know, 
you didn't get pregnant out of wedlock, you know, none of that stuff. And, you know, my grandparents was religious. And she said that back then, if, you know, you got accused of something like that, they would give you shock treatment where you wouldn't remember. She said she was normal, you know, growing up. My sister told me that my grandfather was very angry when he found out my mom was pregnant because it was a disgrace to the family. She wasn't married. She didn't have a boyfriend. And he demanded to know who the father was. And my mom would never tell him. And one time they said that she was cleaning out the bathtub. My grandfather walked by and kicked her in the butt because he was so mad that she was pregnant. And she would never, ever tell him who the father was. Robin would not discover her father's identity until the advent of home DNA kits, like Ancestry or 23andMe. We'll have more on that next episode. But until that time, Robin had to piece together what she could, based on stories she was told by her aunts and uncles, and rumors that predated her birth. I was born February 1971 in Belva, Illinois. My mom was 17 when she gave birth to me. She didn't turn 18 until August of that year. She married an older man whenever she was pregnant to give me a name. Do you know how old she was when she married him? Yeah, she was 17. She married him when she was still pregnant with me. The plan was for Leslie and her new husband to raise Robin. But when Robin was a toddler, somewhere around a year and a half old, she was hospitalized for an illness. When that happened, Leslie made a dramatic choice. Robin still isn't sure why, whether it was related to mental illness or had some other cause, but the effects were long-lasting. And they went to my grandparents' house, and she was crying, and she told them that I had died. I had a pneumonia or the flu or something. I was sick. I was in the hospital, and she told them that I had died. And uh, they called family in and everything else, and everybody was really upset and crying. Bob, her husband, said, come on, let's go home. We're going to get some rest. And back then, they, there was pay phones. And they stopped at a store or something. And he got on the pay phone to tell his son not to worry about dinner. They were going to get some sandwiches and bring them home. And he said, Dad, he said, Robin's not dead. He said he called up to the hospital to see what my cause of death was. And I was fine and ready to be released from the hospital. So... My stepdad got back in the car and told my mom, what you just did was wrong and you should be ashamed of yourself. And we're going back to your mom and dad's house right now and you're going to tell them the truth. Well, when he stopped at a stoplight, my mom jumped out of the car. We asked Robin if anyone had tried to discover why Leslie had lied about her death. I think that they just thought that she wanted attention. I think that that's what they all thought. Mental illness, especially back in that era, was swept under the rug. We've mentioned mental illness a few times now, but haven't gotten specific. That reflects the experience that Robin had growing up. She didn't know much and wasn't given details. Speaking about mental health in Leslie's case is complex. How she was diagnosed decades ago might not be the way that she'd be assessed today. That's what Robin believes. Robin was in her 30s when she discovered that Leslie had been diagnosed with what her family described as paranoid schizophrenia. Robin reports that her aunts and uncles never saw symptoms they associated with schizophrenia in Leslie, but they did see her as impulsive and rebellious. We certainly can't and should not diagnose Leslie, but Robin does wonder if a reassessment or a different form of assessment might have made a difference in her mother's well-being. Back to Robin's hospital stay and the repercussions that followed. Leslie had not only told her own family that Robin had died, but also her husband and her stepson. Did she actually think that Robin was dead? We can't be sure. But the end result was the same. The hospital found out, and Leslie was not allowed to pick Robin up when she was released. She showed up at the hospital. She got in a fight with the nurse because they wouldn't let her have me. And I know that afterwards, my stepdad's son and wife was trying to have a baby and they hadn't got pregnant and they wanted to adopt me. The couple was, by all accounts, very serious about adopting Robin. And Leslie did not want that. And she was so scared 
that they were going to end up adopting me. And she went to her parents and asked her parents if they would adopt me. And my grandfather said, yes, that they would adopt me. And if she ever straightened up and wanted me back, she could always have me back. And I was adopted. So, Robin's formative years were spent in her grandparents' house, as their seventh and youngest child. She was aware that Leslie was her biological mother. They never hid that from her. But her grandmother and grandfather raised her. They made sure that she went to school, did her homework, and they provided for her and cared for her day to day. Her aunts and uncles, they'd all moved out of the house, except for Dorothea, the youngest. She's nine years older than Robin, and Robin says that her grandparents were mostly patient and that they were certainly kind. She can only remember getting in real trouble once when she was little, the kind of trouble that most of us probably got into at one point or another. We was at a little pantry milk store, and I wanted a candy bar, and he told me no, that we was going home to eat supper, and I, I, I remember throwing myself on the ground and throwing a tincture tantrum, and he was so embarrassed that he bought me that candy bar. Whenever we got home, he threw the candy bar at my sister Dorothea, because me and Dorothea are the only two that was raised in the same house together. So uh, he threw the candy bar at Dorothea and asked her if she wanted a candy bar. Robin says that her grandparents doted on her. That's something that she clearly recalls. She also remembers that it was around that time that her mother, Leslie, began leaving Illinois. Sometimes it was for a little while, sometimes for long stretches of time. By then, Leslie had separated from Robin's stepfather. She went to Arizona first because we had family out in Arizona. And Arizona is where she was always usually at. But she would start leaving and she would be gone a year or two at a time and then she would come home. And then it just got really weird. She uh, she would say she was going to a baby shower or going to the grocery store and she'd just be gone. She would leave and she wouldn't come back. And she'd stay gone for a year or two at a time and then she would pop up like she'd never left. And this was normal to me throughout my childhood. And she'd come home for a couple months and then she would be gone again for a couple years. And she did this all the time throughout my whole childhood. When Leslie returned to Illinois, it could be in any physical or emotional state. She could be financially well off and happy, carrying presents for everyone. Or she could be injured and without any funds at all. Robin says that Leslie might have wealthy boyfriends. She might have been engaged in sex work. She might have made friends or adopted a new name. Leslie had always been a highly intelligent woman. That's something Robin knew from a young age. But what she understood mostly as a child was that she never knew what to expect when her mother showed up at the front door. Gosh, I remember her coming home one time with her hair dyed blonde and with, uh, with black eyes. I know that she was in the hospital and her pimp beat her up. She was in a different state and the hospital called home and called dad and dad picked her up either at the airport or the bus station. I remember coming home to that. I was shocked seeing her, you know, she had the blonde hair and the black eyes. I remember that. When there wasn't an emergency, Leslie often arrived in the winter, usually around the holidays. It was really weird. Um, my mom came home mostly around Thanksgiving and Christmas and she would pay for my nieces to have these big, big birthday parties. And she would always promise me a birthday party, and she always left right before my birthday. Always. Did you feel, um, do you remember feeling, like, nervous or happy to see her or just confused? I hated her. That's a strong word to use. I hated her. She wasn't my mom. She was my sister, and I made sure to tell her that when somebody would say, Oh my gosh, look at you and your mom or blah, blah. I'd always say, I'm, I'm her sister. Or she'd say, this is my daughter, Rob. And I'd say, I'm your sister. And I hated that she was my mom. I hated that my mom was the one that was wild. My mom was the one that was never there. You know, everybody else was there. She was the only one that did that. It wasn't until I was in my 30s and her sister sat me down and told me that my mom was paranoid schizophrenic. And she, and she tells me, we never heard that from you. You always knew. And I said, I never knew that. And I asked 
my cousin Ronnie, we were, were close to the same age. I said, did you know that? Because Jan- Janet says mom. And he said, I never knew that, Robin. I said, I didn't either. As we told you earlier, Robin thinks it's possible that Leslie was misdiagnosed. She's never been privy to her mother's medical records or spoken with anyone who treated her. But she does remember many events from childhood and later in life that paint a very complex picture. She told us about one experience that she remembers clearly. It was October 1978, and Robin was in second grade. She can pinpoint it exactly because it was the last year with her grandfather. He died the next year, in the summer of 1979. Leslie had come to visit early that year. My mom came home, and she had joined the Army. This is where it gets interesting. My mom is not a veteran, by the way, so let me tell you the story. So my mom comes home from the Army. She had joined the Army, and she was home on leave. The reason I know it was October 1978 is because our school would dress up for Halloween, and we would have a parade, and we'd go around a couple blocks. She dressed me up in her uniform. Well, then, my mom didn't go back to the Army, so she went AWOL. Well, here comes the MPs. The military police and my principal took me out of my second grade classroom, demanding, wanting to know where my mom was. Well, of course, I didn't know where she was. You know, and I was scared to death, but I didn't know where she was. None of us knew where she was. They went to her sister Janet's house. They were going to arrest Janet because she went to the Army under her sister Janet's name and went AWOL. It was a big ordeal, but they were going to arrest Janet for going AWOL because they thought that Janet had went into the Army. I'm going to say my mom did the basic training, and that was it. But she went in under her sister's name. Assuming her sister's identity to join the Army, then go AWOL, that's exactly what Robin means when she told us that she never knew what to expect from her mom. She could come home after months or a year with a whole new life, a new identity even. Robin still isn't sure why Leslie decided on basic training, but the picking up and then leaving, that felt familiar to Robin. The frequency increased after her grandfather died. In fact, Leslie got in touch soon after his death. Right after my grandfather passed away, my mom knew. How she knew, I don't know. But she called her sister Janet on the phone and said, hey, um, I really want to take mom and Robin to California. You know, dad died. You know, I got them plane tickets. They don't have to bring anything. I got everything that they need. We got on a plane to Los Angeles, California. She picked us up at the airport. She had me like this three-foot stuffed animal dog at the airport. My mom, my grandma, a dozen roses when she picked us up. She took us by taxi cab. We went straight to the mall. She bought us both brand new wardrobes. We stayed at a motel in Hollywood that was $100 a night back in 1979. That's a lot of money in 79. She took me to Disneyland. She said that she was writing songs for Willie Nelson where she got the money. I have no idea. I don't know how much money she had. She was giving me $20 a day in allowance. I thought that I was a rich kid, you know. And of course, I believe that she was writing songs for Willie Nelson. I'm eight years old. Do you think that was not the case? Well, no, she wasn't writing songs for Willie Nelson. No, when my mom wasn't around, we don't know what she did. My grandma believed anything she said. So then she almost runs out of money. She cashes our plane tickets in for bus tickets. And we go to Phoenix, Arizona on a bus from California to go to my aunts and my cousins in Phoenix to visit them. And then one day she just up and disappears while we're in Arizona. And me and my grandmother take a Greyhound bus back to Illinois. Their return to Illinois marked a new, unsettled life for Robin and her grandmother. Without her grandfather's support, they didn't have the steady life they'd had before. At various times, they lived with different relatives. Robin would go to school one year in Illinois and then with family out of state. And Leslie would move in and out of her life. As Robin got older, she became aware that her mother didn't only change lifestyles. She literally changed identities. Her adoption of her sister Janet's name for that short stint in the army, Robin realized that was just the beginning. I remember one time she came home 
and she got pulled over and she told me to keep my mouth shut and that her name was Tiffany. And she had a driver's license under the name Tiffany Brooks with her face on it. Well, then she took me and she shows me how, how to do this. I guess she thought it was cool to show me, you know, and I'm all intrigued about every, all of this. And she took me to the Christian bookstore. She got a uh, baptism certificate, a blank one. She buys that at the Christian bookstore. We leave the Christian bookstore. We go to the library. And she gets on the microchips back then. And she looks up babies who had died at birth that would be around her age. And she would send off for a social security card in their name. Then she would type the baptism record in that person's name. Then she would send a letter back to herself under that person's name. And then she would go to the driver's license bureau and get a driver's license or ID under this person's name, but with her picture on it. With Leslie, it wasn't always about names or jobs or even new home states. She abruptly began and ended relationships, too. One that Robin particularly remembers was with a man who she introduced as her fiancé. This would have been sometime in the early 1980s when Robin was in fifth or sixth grade. She clearly remembers that Leslie brought him home to meet the family in Illinois. Leslie had been gone for a while that time, and Robin isn't sure how her mother met the fiancé, but she remembers that he was a trucker. And she says that they held a wedding. Robin even got to be the flower girl. But, as was often the case, things weren't so simple. So they get married, but there's no record of their marriage because she never turned in the marriage certificate. So she marries this man and wipes his bank account out and leaves, and leaves him there at my grandma's house. Now, he's broke. She just took all of his money. I think it was like $32,000. He calls the police on her. They find that in Kansas City, where she had a motel room, she had bought a puppy, and she had left the puppy and a brand new wardrobe behind and was just gone. Leslie's decision to leave her ex-fiance at her mother's home had lasting effects beyond the theft. Robin isn't sure what criminal charges were or weren't pressed against Leslie in that instance or how the situation with the money was ultimately resolved. But Leslie did come back to Illinois. She had to. In the interim, Robin had reported abuse, allegedly against the truck driver, to a relative. DFCS, the Department of Family and Child Services, had become involved. Robin was at risk of being removed from her grandmother's care, for good. So, Robin said, the decision was made. Leslie put her parents' house up for lease, and she moved Robin, her grandmother, and herself back to Glendale, Arizona, where they had some relatives. This was in Robin's seventh grade year. Their relatives, they weren't the only connection Leslie had to Arizona. She also had an on-again, off-again boyfriend, Adrian, who lived in nearby Scottsdale. He's someone that Robin tells us was important to Leslie. She thinks her mother really loved him, in her way. He was someone who she'd return to, just like she returned to her family in Illinois. And while they were living in Arizona, Robin and her grandmother were able to keep better tabs on Leslie's movements. Because the move to Arizona... It hadn't stopped Leslie's appearances and disappearances. We never knew where my mom was. We always called him, and he'd always say she's okay, or he has heard from her, and then he'd hear from her. But she always went back to him, always, throughout everything. She always went back to him. But Adrian passed away in the 90s, and there's no Adrian to call anymore. So anyway, Adrian lived in Scottsdale. We were living in Glendale. And I come home from school one day, and she had sold all of our furniture to the auction. And I'm throwing a fit. And I'm like, what are you doing? This was grandpa's stuff. You know, I'm, I'm angry. And she was like, we got another place and it's all furnished and it's all brand new and blah, blah, blah. And so we moved to Scottsdale from Glendale into this really nice complex. And it's all furnished. It's, it's real, real, it's beautiful. It seemed like Leslie might have made the move to be closer to Adrian. But if so, she didn't stay put for long. We were there maybe two weeks. Her and my grandma picked me up from school one day and said we were going to Las Vegas for the weekend. We get on an airplane, go to Las Vegas, and the weekend turned into a month. Robin says Leslie took money from Adrian to fund the trip. 
That wasn't totally out of character, and it would not have been a deal breaker with him. But when the money ran out, they still stayed on in Vegas, even when they didn't have a hotel room. Robin remembers having to sleep in the bathrooms at hotels and casinos and worrying about where they get food. Finally, she'd had enough. She reached out to her aunt Janet for help. I called home to my sister, to her sister Janet's, and her roommate answered the phone and wouldn't accept a collect call. And Janet was beside herself when she got home. She said, "You didn't accept it, the collect call. None of us know where they're at. You know, the whole family was freaking out because nobody knew where we were." So I called the Red Cross, and the Red Cross the first thing out of their mouth was, "Why aren't you in school?" <laughs> well, now I'm scared because I think I'm in trouble. You know, I'm calling for help, and they're asking, "Why aren't you in school?" So, you know, you're scared to death now. You think you're in trouble. The, here come the police. The police officer put us in his car and he was taking us to the Red Cross. And I see my mom walking down the street. And I said, there's my mom right there. The police officer pulled over, let us out of the car. And she walked us. We walked to the truck stop. And she got a trucker to take me, her and my grandma to Nebraska. And then from Nebraska, he bought me and my grandma a bus to get to her sister Dorothea's house in Kansas. And that was the longest I didn't see my mom. That time she was gone for five years. Five years. That would be the longest stretch, at least until Leslie truly disappeared. First into her own city's homeless community. And then Robin was certain that she'd never see her again. That is, until proof of life appeared, real as day, across the pages of a newspaper. That and more next time on The Fall Line. If you have any information regarding the location of Claudia Leslie Wells, please reach out to missingandhomeless at gmail.com. If you know of a case that should be covered on The Fall Line, there's a link to our case submission form in the show notes. We're working on several future seasons, including cases in Mississippi, New Mexico, and MMIP cases. That's missing and murdered indigenous persons across the nation. If you're seeking coverage for a loved one or know of an unidentified person's case that fits those parameters, please reach out. We also want to let listeners know that the niece of Leon Lorellis, whose story we covered here on The Fall Line, has started her own podcast. Arlene's podcast, Box in the Basement, can be found anywhere you listen to podcasts. So be sure to tune in. There's a link in the show notes. Thank you for listening. The Fall Line is an independent podcast, and we appreciate listener support. It allows us to do research, obtain FOIA, and pay our content advisors, and support and donate to the causes we care about. If you try out the products we advertise, please use our sponsor codes. It really helps. And please take a moment to rate and review our show on your podcast app of choice. My book, Lay Them to Rest, which covers years of my life working on a Jane Doe case and the world of forensic scientists who resolve unidentified persons' cases, is out everywhere as hardcover, ebook, and audiobook, read by me. You can order it anywhere you get books and through your local library. Find out more in the link in our show notes. If you'd like to support the show and the stories we cover, join us on Patreon or Apple Premium. 100% of our Patreon and Apple Premium earnings are supporting our Family Therapy Fund and actively paying for therapy for families who've appeared on the show. On Patreon, you can get early release ad-free versions of our regular episodes for $5 a month. If you prefer Apple Premium, you can subscribe there as well. On Patreon, we also post occasional giveaways, updates, and blogs, which all patrons can enjoy, starting at just a dollar. The Fall Line is written, hosted, and researched by Laura Norton, with additional research by Brian Warders. Interviews by Brooke Hargrove. Produced, engineered, and scored by Maura Curry. Content advisement by Brandy C. Williams and Vic Kennedy. And, as always, our most special thanks to Liz Lipka. Listener.